Hey, I missed something last week. Uh, I want to draw your attention to it. I said chapter 14, but would you mind uh, looking up the page a bit to chapter 13? Look at verse 15. We believe, both Nicole and I and many that have been here a while, we believe that perhaps one of the most powerful ministry tools in the world is just keep showing up. And I want to show you something. It's all through the scriptures, and I missed it last week. We were running pretty quick. Chapter 15, please, verse 13. Chapter 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, says Job, which is the whole point of the book of Job. I don't know what you're doing, Lord, but I know who you are. We saw that on Sunday with um, Peter. You're going to leave me too about that eat my flesh, drink my blood comment, you know, and Peter's all, I'm not going to lie, Lord. Wow, that was rough. But who else has the words of life? We're going to stick it out with you. The Old Testament equivalent, I think, is right here. Here's Job. I don't know what's going on. His buddies are all saying, you must have done something. I don't know, but I know this, verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways. Circle the word defend and write in the margin. That's the Hebrew word, yekah. Yekah. And it means... To appear, to manifest yourselves. Let me rephrase. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So until I die, I will just keep showing up. <laughs> Amen. How many of you have ever gotten to your devotion? Or even before that, you've poured the coffee. You look over at your Bible you sense the Holy Spirit saying, come sit with me. And you're like, I got no emotion for this. There's something powerful about just going over, opening that Bible. Just keep showing up. Difficult relationships, towering challenges. Just keep showing up. God says, if I've told you to be here, to stay here, if I've told you to step out and to keep moving in a certain direction, just keep showing up. Please notice, here it is, and if we spoke Hebrew, it would have jumped out at us a bit more. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so, I will just keep showing up. Amen? All right, now chapter 14. Sorry I missed that one last week. That was a good one. Chapter 14, verse 1, Job continues to respond to Mr. Eliphaz. Remember, his name means, my God is gold. Bildad, and his name means flighty. And then you have Zophar. Pardon me. Bildad's name means, my love will hurt you. And Zophar means flighty. They have a misinformed wisdom. So here's Job continuing to respond. Chapter 14. Man who is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> you ever felt that way before? Humans are frail and they don't live that long. And this short life is full of difficulties. If anybody ever says to you, follow Jesus and it's easy from here. They don't know the book of Job, and they have not walked with the Lord more than a few seconds. If anybody tries to sell you, if you just had more faith, if you just did whatever, you crossed the finish line of accomplishment, then it's cooler from here. I don't know about you, but that's never been my experience. Walking with God, that's beautiful. But the enemy comes against you, and that's hard. That's what, that's what Job is saying. Verse 2, he comes forth like a flower, this man, and then he fades away. And he flees like a shadow and does not continue. And do you, God, do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? He's saying God is watching everyone all the time. Verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. He's basically saying, Lord, um, how can you demand purity from humans who are impure? 
And you know what? Job is right. A good place to write Psalm 51, verse 5. Paul, or, um, David, King David says, I was brought forth, born in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. Now, some people look at that funny and they say, is this saying that husband and wife conceiving a child is sin? No, it is not saying that. In fact, Hebrew, Hebrews 13 verse 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed, marriage bed undefiled. Now, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So back to that Psalm 51 verse 5, it is not saying Husband and wife conceiving a child is sin. It is saying that inside every human DNA, built in, baked in, <clears throat> is a hungry appetite for sin. <laughs> That's probably not your condition, but I know it is certainly mine. And thanks a lot, Adam, because that's where it all began. Billy Graham, I think, said it best. He said... We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. You can't stop. It's in your DNA. Nobody can stop sinning on their own. That's why we need a Savior. That's a critical truth in the gospel. Hey, come to Jesus and your life will be better. Or a um, very respected uh, track used to say, God loves you <clears throat> and has a wonderful plan for your life. And most of us who are self-centered, we say, that's awesome. I love me too. And I have a wonderful plan for my life. So the, the classic sort of just say these words after me, and you're in like Flynn. I don't know about that. Um, conviction has to do its deep work before there is true conversion. The Laodicean church we sort of described on Sunday is full, potentially, of people who are really not converted. I mean, they love to sing the songs of God. That's cool. We love to hang around godly sort of things and people. And boy, do I love those sort of smoke machine flying lights and soaring choruses that often pine over and over how much God loves me. Now, that is true, to be sure, but is church relief really to make us feel better? I don't think so. Church is not for us. It's for him. So this notion of um, if I'm not convicted of sin, if I'm not really, truly sort of absolutely overwhelmed by man, I have sinned horribly against people and against God. Oh, my. Oh, my sin. If there's not been a conviction of sin, I don't believe there can be a conversion. You may say the sinner's prayer, the classic sinner's prayer, but I can show you four instances, pardon me, eight instances. I can show you eight instances of somebody in the Old and New Testament saying a sinner's prayer. Oh, I am so very sorry for my sin. Four of them are not in heaven. Interesting idea. The Laodicean church is designed to appeal to, the, to a larger crowd. So we're not going to talk about the difficult things of the Bible. We're not going to talk about sin and its effect. We're going to talk about all the cool goodies that you get in your grab bag, your merch pile, when you come and receive Jesus. Please understand that Job is not what you would call a, a he is not a, 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 he is not for the health and wealth gospel, not right now. Uh, chapter 1, verse 8 said that, that at this time, Job was one of the most righteous guys on the planet. He doesn't understand it either. We know we know it's the enemy testing him, and God has let it happen. And Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar are saying, what? You must have done something. And Job is saying, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand. I didn't do something wrong. Verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. 
Lord, did I do something wrong? As far as I know, I've confessed everything. I know how to confess. And yet still this challenge is visiting my life. That's so important. None of us are righteous. No, not one. And I was born in sin. That is to say, it's right in my DNA. Billy Graham, we're not sinners because we sin. Huh, sinner? No, no, we sin because we are sinners. We cannot stop. It is so crucial, a portion of the gospel. Do you understand what your sin has cost you, those around you, and how that has hurt the heart of a holy God? I don't believe there's true conversion without conviction. I just don't. As John Corson says, you know what? Sin is in our genes we need to change our genes and put on new garments. I love how he does that. See, get it? Sin is in our genes, G-E-N-E-S. So we got to change our genes, J-E-A-N. Yeah, you'll get it tonight, later. You'll bolt right up out of bed. I got it. You got to change your genes and put on new garments. Isaiah 6, verse 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in my Lord. Hmm. My soul shall be joyful in God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Hey, you got bad genes? Take off those genes and put on some robes. Amen? I borrowed that from John Carson. I wish I could turn a phrase like that. Verse 5. Well, since his are human, since humans' days are determined, the number of his months is with you, God. You, not me, have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. This is very important. Um, this is one of those sections where the Bible talks quite effectively, I believe, about suicide. Who has designed your book? God has, and he has an intention. You are fearfully and wonderfully made and God has made you and he's had all eternity to think and consider and design you for what he has called you to do and to be. The enemy, of course, gets in there and says, nah, -uh, you're a mistake. Um, depending on how you came up and what mirrors were mirroring back to you, some of you have had some pretty rough past and some of you have heard horrible things said by potentially even parents, you are an accident. Or we didn't want you at all in the first place. Under the sun, those are hurtful things that some folks never recover from. But please notice here, God here through Job and certainly through Psalm 139, you and I were fearfully and wonderfully made. He has designed for you a very full life and course. But when the devil gets into somebody's brain, <clears throat> I call it the suicide fly. It comes in and it flies out. You have to know that when that kind of thing happens and you can't seem to get your mind off of death and ending it all, please understand that the majority of that comes from a super natural place. They're literally demons that are whispering into your heart and trying to shine some sort of morbid life on where you've come from and they don't want you to ever truly grasp. You're not fearfully and wonderfully made. Notice here that God says, I have set your days. According to the U.S. Center for, D for Disease Control, more than 18% of Americans have been diagnosed with significant depression. Last year, this country's ninth leading cause of death was suicide. Fascinating. For ages 10 through 14 and ages 20 through 34, suicide was the second leading killer. That's astounding to me. For every one actual suicide, this is chilling, for every one <clears throat> actual suicide, there were 10 unsuccessful attempts. God intervened. Suicide is a very real thing. And especially as this culture continues to stampede away from God's 
will and God's word, then God is taking his hand of protection off and more and more of this stuff is going to happen. Suicide is way wrong. You know it and I knew it and know it intuitively. And among so many reasons, here's one I want you to consider, please. Here's what God's word says. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, oh, I missed the first part, but it's verses 19 through 20. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. We have this notion, it's my life, I get to do what I want. Well, the designer of the heavens and the earth said no. Well, what makes the Bible so right? Well, we got Israel as a nation. Do I have to go down that prophetic road one more time? Naming King Cyrus and Jehoshaphat, uh, pardon me, Josiah, by name, generations before they were born? How many prophecies? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Did you know that that's in the Bible before he was born? Um, he was what? Uh, he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah told you that was going to happen 500 B.C., and there's a jillion more. If the Bible is right about that, then why wouldn't it be right about this? You are not your own. You don't belong to you. This body, this life here under the sun, you are a steward of. What you going to do with God, with what God gave you? First Corinthians, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Also, Romans 14, verse 7. No man lives to himself, and no man dies to himself. If we live, it is to honor the Lord. And if we die, it is to honor the Lord too. So whether you live or die, we belong to God. All right, so among the many reasons why suicide is so wrong, number one, it's one of the most singularly, singularly selfish thing that anybody could ever do. Because you're so consumed with self, what you see and feel, now, those are very real emotions, and when that happens, would you please just say in the name of Jesus, you spiritual stronghold of suicide, you get off of me. I know who you are. I saw you with the man of Gadara and the tombs. He was consumed with death too. Lord Jesus, I pray in Jesus' precious name, anyone in this room or within the sound of my voice, Lord, they would describe it as a well they can't see out of. They will describe it as a wave of hopelessness and futility that will overwhelm me. I know it seems that way. But would you please see biblical truth that if you were to take your life now, you would scar and hurt loved ones for years, even decades. It's the singular, most selfish act, I believe, any human is capable of doing. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray you would give everyone that glimmer that they were fearfully, wonderfully made and that Job knows this even in his terrible time. His wave of futility and why is this happening? He was able to grasp. Lord, the days you've given me are your business, not mine. Pray that, Lord, in Jesus' name. In the Bible, did you know that suicide is a symptom of spiritual collapse? It is. Um, I thought about going over seven suicides in the Bible and showing you behind each one of them. But I'll just mention them quickly. Judas, he hanged himself. Was he repentant? No, he was remorseful. He was not repentant. I doubt if we will see him in heaven. Spiritual collapse. How much did Jesus show him? What did he see? What teachings did he have packed away in his mind and heart? Spiritual collapse. King Saul. Spiritual collapse. The great prophet Samuel said, you know, ABC, and he wouldn't listen. 
And then he's finally going to go fight this guy. And, and uh, Samuel, he's going to try to find a prophet, no prophet around. So remember what Saul does? He goes to the witch of Endor. If you remember uh, Saul, because Samuel told him, you've got to get rid of all of the diviners, all of the occult people. And so Saul did okay. So he made it a law. You can't be um, calling up the dead. But in his time of spiritual collapse, when he wanted to go fight this guy, and every word of God said, don't do it, I gotta. He actually seeks out the witch of Endor. If you remember the story, he, he fakes like he's a woman. Kunk, kunk, kunk on the door. She'll never recognize me. And before the lady even opens the door, she says, come in, King Saul. Yeah. How'd you know it was me? Dude, seriously? And there's one person that I'm aware of that came from um, Sheol. If you remember, there was the paradise side, Abraham's bosom side, and then the other side. There's one other person that I'm, I'm familiar with that actually the Lord says, I'll let you pick up the line. Saul's on the other end. Should I go to this ill-fated thing? And the actual disembodied spirit of Samuel gets on the line. Saul, is that you? Samuel? <laughs> Dude, no! And what does Saul do anyway? Well, it's curtains for him at that battle, if you know the story. And before the enemy could get him, he falls on his sword. Another guy by the name of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather, very likely. And for the longest time, Ahithophel was one of the most trusted counselors of King David. And then when King David's son Absalom leads a rebellion, Absalom, or pardon me, Ahithophel, it would seem, was nursing a grudge all of those years. Because remember, Ahithophel very likely is Bathsheba's grandfather. And did Ahithophel know about the dirty business between David, Bathsheba, and Bathsheba's husband? It would seem that Ahithophel, his name means, my brother is foolish. And Ahithophel, when Absalom presents this plan to overthrow the king, Ahithophel jumps ship and jumps in with the enemy. Fascinating. Why would he do that? My hunch is that he was nursing and rehearsing, and rehearsing a grudge, and he never got it clean. And the Bible says careful, because that root of bitterness will defile many. Ahithophel died. Total spiritual collapse. Zimri, 1 Kings 16, he was a rebel. And there was a man of the tombs in Jesus' time in Luke 8, and he almost killed himself. But he didn't. And who did he run into? Jesus. And he was healed. 6,000 demons. The suicide fly is always, always Demons messing with you. Please don't ever forget. Well, back to our exhausted Job. I wanted you to see that and spend a little time here because Job's circumstances were pretty overwhelming. He wanted to die, but notice he didn't, of his own volition, initiate the process. Please understand, he thought about, man, wouldn't it be better if I wasn't here because this is too much. But please notice, even in the midst, he goes, not my job to number my days. That's a God thing. Please notice that. Let's pick up the story. Verse 6. Look away from him that he may rest till, like a hired man, he finishes his day. Because my human life is so short, Lord, please let this trial pass. Because <laughs> I need to get back to your work. Verse 7. For there, is, for there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again and that its tender roots shall not cease. Though its roots may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground, yet if there is water around, verse 9, the scent of water, it will not completely die. It will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. But man dies and is laid away. 
Indeed, he breathes his last. Now, where is he? Uh, remember, or, or what he's saying is, you guys know this. If there's water around, even a cut down tree can grow new shoots. But Lord, if I die, then that's it. Job, Lord, I want to serve you more, but you've got to take this trial away or I will die. Verse 11. As water disappears from the sea and a river becomes parched and dries up, so man lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, they will not awake or, nor be roused from their sleep. Talking about dead people in the grave. Verse 13. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me at a set time and remember me. What he's talking about here is either resurrection of an old body or life after death. That's kind of what he's talking about here. If a man dies, shall he live again? What he's saying rhetorically is, I know that there's life after the grave. All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. That's not uh, nickels and dimes and quarters. That is, he knows that he is going to get a resurrected body, I believe. I know it, and I know I'm going to be with God for all eternity. Verse 15, you shall call, and I will answer you. Well, remember, if he ceases to exist after the grave, then it wouldn't do God any good to call him. I'm going to be alive. I know it. You shall call, verse 15, and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. That's me. If I am not, if you are not, Going through a trial presently will good for you. <laughs> but you will, amen, all of us are, until Jesus fixes planet Earth. And when I do go through that trial, please take a page from Job here. I must remember something, that in the midst of any terrible stress, when does Job's faith rise? When he talks about eternity, living again, when he remembers the reality of forever with God. Won't be like it is here. Please notice Jesus did the same thing. He did, yeah. Right after Jesus told his disciples that he was about to die there in John 13, then you get to John 14. For a hopeless bunch of um, disciples with heavy hearts, Jesus said this. Let not your heart be troubled, boys, because in my Father's house are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. I want you to notice when Jesus said that. He said it right after a very distressing message. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be crucified. And they're all, what? And as you know, even when he said it, they really didn't believe him. And please notice that Jesus knows that when a human heart is really going through it, like Job, please remember, you weren't made for this under the sun. We were made for eternity. Mm. Numbers 15, verse 38, this is interesting. Do you know that Israel was commanded to put blue fabric on the borders of their garments? Well, in those days, it was a bit like a dress. Well, you shouldn't say a dress. What would you say? It was a long sort of tunic thing that when you walked, your shins would kick up the hem. And every time you looked down at your feet walking, you would see a flash of blue. Why? God says, because blue is the color of heaven. And I want you to remember with every single step, through the good times and through the bad times, please never forget, Israel, you are constantly reminded. With every step, you are reminded about being a heavenly people. So should we. Amen? Verse 16. For now you number you my, for now you, Lord, you number my steps but do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag and you cover my iniquity. What he's basically saying is I feel like you're keeping track of all my sin. 
You're not watching my steps. You're watching my sin. It's what it feels like. I don't know what to tell you. I confessed everything. And I like what John Corson says here. He says, Lord, it feels like you're collecting my sin and putting it in a bag. That's what Job thought. And then John Corson says, well, he would be correct. What? Yeah, Micah 7, verse 19 God does gather all your sins, if you will, in a bag. And then what does he do with it? <laughs> he, God, Micah 7, verse 19, he, God, will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities and he will cast all of our bag of sins into the depth of the sea. I got another bag of sin option. It's option number two. That's Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God cast our transgressions from us. Uh, the writer of Hebrews cites that verse. He cites Psalm 103, verse 12, and then he adds a little bit, uh, and then he adds in Hebrews 10, verse 17, oh, and I will remember those sins never, ever again. Hey, is there a bag of sins? I think uh, Job is on to something. Well, kind of. <laughs> but if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, what happened to your bag of sins? <laughs> or he hurls that bag as far as the east is from the west. Uh, how far is that? <laughs> Verse 18. But as a mountain falls and crumbles away, and as a rock is moved from its place, as water wears away even the biggest stones, and as torrents wash away the soil of the earth, so you destroy the hope of man, or so it seems. Verse 20. You prevail forever against him, and he passes on. And then you change his countenance. <laughs> Literally in Hebrew, that means you make us wrinkle. How many of you used to love looking in the mirror in your 20s? Oh, God, you know, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. Uh, you having a birthday as a mirror is not your friend. <laughs> you make us wrinkle, Lord. What's up with that? And then you send him away. In other words, you die. Verse 21. And then his sons come to honor, and he does not know the person who died. Um, they are brought low, perhaps, and he does not perceive it. In other words, we die before we know how our children will turn out on some occasions. Verse 22, but his flesh will be in pain over it and his soul will mourn over it. Job, life is short. There's lots of pain. And then we get wrinkles. <laughs> and then we can't remember stuff. That's what he's saying. That's either what, senile or Alzheimer's. And we don't even recognize our own kids. What's up with that, Lord? Then our kids go through the same cycle. And so ends round one. Two more rounds to go, you guys. Ding! You know, in this Kona, here comes Eliphaz. Eliphaz chapter 15, here he comes. Do you think Eliphaz was listening to Job and going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, you know what? Wow, I had no idea that God was such a God of mercy as well as righteousness. Is Eliphaz going to change his tune? Remember, he went first last time, and his first thing was, it's cause effect, dude. You do good, God has to bless you. You do bad, that's why God gives you a hard time. Job, don't you see that it rains on the evil and the good? There's plenty of circumstances. Remember the fish? Have you been watching the fish? Have you ever noticed how big fish eat little fish? No matter how nice the little fish are? And Eliphaz, hmm, stroking his beard. Here it comes, chapter 15. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, answered and said, Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Oh, my. Job, you're full of hot air, dude. Verse 3. Should he, really me, Eliphaz, the wise one, should I reason with unprofitable talk? or by speeches with which he can do no good? Your logic is terrible, Job. I don't buy it, verse 5. Yes, you cast off or have no fear or restrain prayer. You have no reverence before God. Remember, Eliphaz had said, I know what your problem is. You sinned. In fact, I had a dream, 
I had a Holy Spirit encounter. I had goosebumps and everything. I know I'm right. My feelings solidify and uh, testify that this is true. By the way, how do your feelings do, as a rule, by discerning truth? Doesn't the Proverbs have something to say about that? Yeah, there's a way, there's a way that feels right to a man, but then the end thereof is dis- destruction. Verse 5. Job, your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and I do not. Yes, your own lips testify against you. I don't like your lips either, Job. <laughs> Eliphaz seems more concerned about being right here, I think, than knowing the truth. Remember, James chapter 3 talks about this. Who is wise and discerning among you? And all of us would say, well, me. James says, really? If it has this, 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 and this in it, that is not God. Because the wisdom that does come from above is, first of all, peaceable, willing to yield. Notice that Eliphaz is not willing to yield. He is so James 3 right now. I know what I'm talking about, Job. You're full of beans. I know the truth. Eliphaz seems more concerned about being right than knowing the truth. I wrote my margin, yeah, religion will do that. Where is Eliphaz's compassion? Where's his mercy? Where's his empathy? Is his friend Job going through a real tough time? And he has sores on the top of his head, the soles of his feet. He's lost his kids. You're full of hot air, Job. Let me tell you about more about my wisdom. Oh, right on, right there. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and on. Religion will do that. If I'm checking all the boxes and performing my religion um, in an admirable way, then it doesn't matter what's going on on the inside. If my outside looks good, doing all the stuff, it doesn't matter what's going on inside. What did Jesus say about that? It's not what goes into the man that defiles. It comes, it comes, what comes out of a man. There's where the real skippy is. What horrible atrocities have been committed in the name of religion? Can you think of a few? That's where, frankly, most of the horrific mutilations of humans slashing apart and worse other humans, it's used in the name of their religion. Hamas, last October, you know about some of the specifics. You know about the unspeakable evil that was done. But they think it's okay because it was their religion. Oh, and by the way, many of them, of course, were high on narcotics, if you didn't know that. How many billions of humans has the devil killed because of religion? During the first half of the Great Tribulation alone, if you do your homework, did you know that the one world religion, when Jesus takes the real church out before the rapture, there is a tremendous ecumenical movement And now that those crazy fundamentalist Christians are gone, now we can have all the kumbaya stuff that we want. We're going to take the best of all the religions. And for three and a half years, it would seem that there is a unified world religion that is facilitated or able to make happen because of the Antichrist. She is termed the harlot of Babylon. It's in Revelation chapter 17. The first three and a half years, she rides on the beast or the Antichrist. So she rises to power. And then the Bible says that she is drunk with the blood of the saints. I don't know how many that's going to be, but I'll bet it's going to be millions. Halfway into the the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist then, he is indwelt directly by Lucifer himself. And he casts off the harlot. Nobody's going to worship nobody but me. And then the beast devours the harlot. And so that's what that's all about. I want you to notice that Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar have a religious spirit. And when you have a religious spirit, please notice, not much compassion. One more thought. 
Like all religion, God's true Holy Spirit is bringing conviction of truth. And I believe it's happening here. Eliphaz, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's not going to let Job know he's thinking this. But I wonder if Eliphaz is all, oof. Now, if Job is right, and if God allows bad things to happen to righteous people, oof, I could be next. Oh, hey. And I wonder if he's saying, I don't know if I could say, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Anyway, verse 7. Are you the first man who was born, Mr. Job? Or were you made before the hills? You think you're so smart? Verse 8. Have you learned the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we don't know? I wrote my margin, plenty. What do you understand that is not in us? Wrote, lots and lots. And I couldn't help but think, you know who this sounds like? We hear God too, dude. Sounds a lot to me like Mr. Korah in number 16. Do you remember him? He is related. He's a cousin. Pardon me. He is, oh, it escapes me how he is their dads, Moses' dad, Amram, and Korah's dad are brothers. That's what it is. So this is a cousin. In the 40 years Moses was watching sheep, Korah was still in Egypt being a honcho. The ten plagues get uh, Pharaoh to let them go. Out they come. The, uh, Moses stretches out his staff and the, and the Red Sea parts. You know the story. Shekinah glory is there every day, every night. Manna in the morning. And when they get a little semblance of, you know, okay, we're out here. Who sticks their nose up into the air and says, I hear God too. You need to let me lead. Remember that? And so God says, what am I supposed to do? You know the story. Uh, they're supposed to take these things, take them to the temple, and then uh, show up there the next day. And Korah really believes that God is with him. I'll take my censor. I'm going to so show up. About time God sees it like me, you know. About time Moses sees how awesome I am. And they show up, actually show up to the tabernacle. And then God says, hey, Moses, tell the people, move back. And then the ground opens up. Do you remember Korah was of the same spirit? You think you're so hot, Job? I hear God too. <coughs> Proverbs 26, verse 12. That Korah only gets me right here, always gets me right there. Not only that, <coughs> it wasn't just Korah. Do you remember who else died? All of his family. It wasn't just Korah and all of his family who died. You know who else? 250 of the prominent men of Israel. Korah was evidently quite adept at politicking. He got 250 of the leading men of Israel to join his campaign down with Moses, up with Korah. The ground opened up and swallowed Korah and Dathan another guy, and then all their families closed up. And then the Bible says, fire from heaven <clears throat> selectively zapped 250 other rebels. And in my mind's eye, ah, 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 the shrack got you. Hiding behind the ooh, ooh, zap. Horizontal lightning, zap, zap, zap. Zap! 250 individually targeted lightning strikes. Would you call that supernatural? The ground opened up, closed up and swallowed, followed by 250 strategic lightning strikes. Would you see that as being a supernatural event answering rebellion? Do you know what the people did after that they were mad and they were mad at Moses do you see how contagious rebellion can be it's fascinating and they got mad and we need to kill not the rebels but Moses 
And that's when God says, I'm going to bring a, I'm going to bring a, a terrible plague. And the plague started. And there's that story where Moses says to Aaron, the high priest, run, run, Aaron, run and grab the coal from the altar and take it to the golden altar. Run, hurry, hurry. A plague had started and thousands were dying suddenly because of their rebellious heart and how they loved and championed a rebel and hated God's leadership. And there's Moses running through the crowd. Slow down, Aaron, you're going to hurt somebody. And they had no idea that every single one of them were being saved by intercessory prayer of Moses, the guy that they hate. You're a creep and a bum and we don't like you. And he's the one praying for them and saved their lives. That's why Jesus would say, pray for those who have spitefully used you. It's a powerful thing. The enemy can capture your heart if you are bummed out enough about another human. If there is some human in your life that you would swear is the reason why you don't have to be love, joy, peace, patience. You are in sort of that same boat. You're yelling at Aaron running past you. Slow down, Aaron, you're going to hurt somebody. And it's Aaron on a mission from his brother. Get to the altar. Sin offering. Fascinating story. But I want you to notice, I wonder if this is uh, Eliphaz. In fact, I, I started, didn't I? I'm sorry, I got a little off on that one. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for him than a fool. Oops. And one more, I think you'll get a kick out of this one. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof is stupid. <laughs> All right, King James, stupid. Verse 10, let's zoom to the end. goes quickly from here. Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us. They're on our side, Job. The smartest people around believe us. Much older than your father, verse 11, are the consolations of God too small for you and the words spoken gently with you. Why aren't you listening to us, Job? Why does your heart, really, tell us what the secret sin is, will you? Tell us why does your heart, your secret sin, carry you away? And what do your eyes wink at? Would you just admit it? Verse 13. That you turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth? Just admit your secret sin, will you? Stop blaspheming our understanding of God. I thought to myself, that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees did too. Verse 14. Can you see how destructive religion can be? Verse 14. What is man that he could be pure? And he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous? Eliphaz is saying, you claim to be righteous, Job, but nobody can say that. Now, to a degree, is Eliphaz correct? Well, to a degree, but Job is, is, Job is saying he's innocent of confessed sin. He says, I confessed every sin that I knew of. God said that Job was righteous. Let's get our facts straight, Mr. Eliphaz. Job 1, verse 8. Verse 15. If God puts no trust in his saints, he's speaking of angels here, and heavens are not pure in his sight. Oh, really? Well, how does he have this understanding? We know that to be true because did Lucifer have access to heaven and God? Yeah. How did Eliphaz know that? Verse 16, how much less than man who is abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water. <laughs> and that's true. Man is thirsty for sin. Look, Job, doesn't, God doesn't even trust his own angels, all right? And Lucifer was an angel. How much less than humans? Which means you, pal, like most religions, Eliphaz is right about everything except that God actually has grace and how God truly saves. Job is familiar with that. He's been saying so the last couple chapters. Verse 17. Eliphaz continues, I will tell you, hear me what I have seen, I will declare. 
What wise men have told, not hiding anything received from their fathers. This has been a long, a longly held uh, um, truth. It's incorrect, but tradition, tradition. Verse 19, to whom alone the land was given and no alien had passed among them. Remember that way back then. The wicked man writhes with pain all of his days and the number of years is hidden from the oppressor. Dreadful sounds are in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer comes upon him. Now, what he's doing here is he's basically saying, you know, a wicked man might prosper for a minute, but God always gets them when they're sinful. This is a backhanded thing toward Job. Was Job rich once? Had he lost everything? So that's what he's talking about. Yeah, where's your compassion, Eliphaz? Verse 22. He does not believe that he will return from darkness from a sword is w- for a sword is waiting for him. He wanders about for bread saying, where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is ready, already at hand. He's talking about Job. This is you, pal. Trouble and anguish make him afraid. They overpower him like a king ready for battle. For he stretches out his hand against God and acts defiantly against the Almighty this is Eliphaz saying, this is what you're doing, Job. Running stubbornly against him with his strong embossed shield. Wow. Eliphaz, Job, look at yourself, dude. You were once prosperous. Now you have nothing. You're hearing things, man. You have, you have anxiety. You're neurotic. You must have done something to make God mad. He continues. Verse 27. Though he, speaking of a wicked person, really you, Job, has covered his face with his fatness. That means you've been eating so well you've got a big fat face. (laughs) Wow, he's got sure compassion, isn't he? You know, Job, you've got a big fat face, dude. There's sores on it now, but you know, you've got a fat face. You know how that works. And made his waist heavy with fat. (laughs) My goodness. You're overweight, Job, because you were rich. He dwells in desolate cities, in houses which no one inhabits. Oof, ouch. Did Job lose his house? Yeah. Which are destined to become ruins, like yours did, Job. Verse 29, he will not be rich, nor will his wealth continue, nor will his possessions overspread the earth if he doesn't confess. Verse 30, he will not depart from darkness. The flame will dry out his branches. Oh, my. Do you remember what happened to his his crops and stuff? There was a fire. That's how he lost his possessions. And by the breath of his mouth, a cyclone, a tornado, if you will. Oof. How did his kids die? A big cyclone came out of nowhere and wrecked the house and killed them all inside. My goodness, Eliphaz. He will go away, verse 31. Let him not trust in futile things. Deceiving himself for futility will be his reward. It will be accomplished before his time, and his branch will not green. He's talking about his kids. Yeah, you lost your kids right there, Job. Verse 33. He will shake off his unripe grape like a vine. Your kids got stripped from you like grapes off of a vine because of your sin, Joe. And cast off his blossom like an olive tree. This is especially cruel. This is a reference to how Job lost his kids. Verse 34, for the company of hypocrites will be barren and fire will consume the tents of the bribery. Of bribery. That's how he lost his tents. They conceive trouble, bring forth futility. Their womb prepares deceit. Whoo, my goodness. Eliphaz, round two, and he's still cause effect, dude. Just admits that you have some secrets in, Job. Whoo. Uh, Tune in next week. It gets worse. (laughs) Let's all stand. Lord, we want to thank you that you are not, by and large, your love, I should say. Your love for your kids, your son and daughters, is not because we earned it. Praise your name. 
Praise your name. Praise your holy name. You love us because we are your sons and daughters. And then you say, I love you warts and all. While you were still in the midst of terrible sin, that's when I saved you. He said something similar to Israel. Men, were you in a tough spot? Nobody wanted you. I did. So I pray, Lord, by your grace tonight, when I'm tempted to hold a grudge or really be bummed at somebody and use a very old excuse, I don't have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control. You see, I don't have it right now, Lord, because of what they're doing or because of what they won't do or because of what they have done. Let us take a page. It sure looks silly on Mr. Eliphaz. It's not cause effect. God doesn't love you. He doesn't love me because we earned it. When we, are at our, when we were at our most sorriest state, he loved me so much then that he stretched out his arms and he died on the cross for me. And Jesus would say, if I love you like that and have forgiven you of all of that, billions if you will, and you can't turn around and forgive someone else of that small debt in comparison, the Bible says that Jesus said, there's only one thing that will chase someone that's that dog with a bone kind of attitude towards something they're upset with. I got to let the bussinidso, the tormentors, I got to let them at you a bit. If you didn't know that to be true, check it out. The unmerciful servant. If I'm so stubbornly holding on to a grudge, God will say sometimes the only thing that loosens the jaw the lockjaw on that is I'll have to let the enemy take a couple whacks at you. And maybe like Job, you're recognizing, Lord, thank you that you do not judge us like you should. And I pray, Father, that we always are walking in forgiveness because what, my, oh my, what you forgave me of. In Jesus' name, Lord, thank you for the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, everybody said, Amen.